So how many people have done just first interviews here? You're getting to know a candidate and you, you pick up the phone for the initial phone call. Do you have a template of what you follow right now? Or key, just, I, okay, I need these five pieces of information to make sure that I end the call with. Sometimes? Okay, so this is about what to grab on the first call. Um, you got somebody's resume either from a proactive search or inbound, so they apply directly to one of your positions. And this is actually from a cheat sheet that I have. I will start with, um, with some of the more ambiguous aspects of this. So with the return to office, you do have to start asking about location, and this will become a bigger issue if they're not located in Champaign-Urbana and you want them to be. So current location, desired location, and then desired compensation information. So there's some hiring managers feel comfortable talking about compensation on the first call, others do not. I always bring it up on the first call, and that's for a few different reasons. Um, one is that money is not the most important aspect of going towards a new job, but it is in the top three. If you look at any surveys really across the board, a candidate's willingness to make a move is based off of, in at least some part, in compensation. It's usually within the top three of reasons why a candidate might be willing to be mobile. So the way I ask this question is, have you thought about your comfort zone when it comes to compensation? Here's a little bit more about what our compensation package is and what we offer. We offer a base salary, plus relocation, plus bonus, uh, and maybe you offer some type of equity or, or stock options. And so you give the candidate an idea of what they can expect so that they're able to answer the, the question roughly and honestly. Now, um, this is still a tricky situation, or it's still a tricky question because the candidate can then come back and say, you know, I really haven't thought about it and I'm not sure what my range is. Can you tell me what the range is for the position? And this is where it's important for the employer, for the employer to have provided this first interviewer with enough information to be able to answer the question or punt it. But you at least need to know what your job is when it comes to this, this first question. And I'll, actually, I'll pause for a second. The reason why it's important to ask this is for the employer and also for the candidate. So one, you're building trust with the candidate in this way. You're acknowledging that money is an important aspect of, of taking a new position, because it is. It's, it's your livelihood. It's the way that you, you support your livelihood. Um, and it's also a way for the employer not to invest a, a lot of time into a candidate if at the end of the day there's a, a decent gap when it comes to compensation. So it is important, maybe you don't bring it up on the first call, but it has to be brought up roughly early on so that you have some type of a, understand, a mutual understanding of at least a range that you're, that you're discussing. And so it builds trust on the candidate side, but it also enables the employer to set expectations early on, not only with the team, but maybe with their executives, like we really like this person, um, it's going to cost us between 100,000 to 125. Maybe they were thinking that they would be 80 to 90. It's a way to set expectations early on. Uh, okay, so back to how, how you get this question answered. Um, I did do a presentation earlier on that was all about how to come up with salary ranges, and I am happy to send that as well. So each interviewer should be prepared with some type of a range of what, you're, what you are able to offer the role. If you don't already have that or you haven't thought about it, it's a good way to think about, or it's a good way to think about what your compensation philosophy is overall. If you can't tell a candidate on the phone like what your total compensation package is, you really need to start thinking about it. So total compensation is not just your base salary, but also everything that would add up to to monetary compensation at the end of the year and benefits. You can also throw in non-monetary benefits into that if you do a four-day work week or you have other ways that you provide a way for your employees to have more of their time back or to gain an education. So your total compensation package is 
is everything from base, bonus, equity, health care, and then your non-monetary benefits as well. Okay, so you ask the candidate, what's your, what's your comfort zone when it comes to compensation? Uh, they say, okay, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I haven't thought about it. Honestly, I find this question a little bit awkward. Can you tell me what the range might be? From there, what I do is I look at what I've what have I already researched and determine what might be a good range, and I'll give them roughly the middle point. The reason why I do this is because it, it allows them to know that we thought about it, that I thought about it as somebody that decided to get on the phone with them, and that I'm not trying to be secretive necessarily about something that's so important, it's such an important aspect of taking a new job. That it is, does anybody, does anybody think that it's not important? Okay, all on the same page. Um, and, and I don't think that you can really understate how much trust it does build with the candidate when you're willing to provide a certain level of transparency early on so that they also know if they want to invest a decent amount of their time through your interview process and then vice versa. And then say the candidate comes in a little bit high. Say you wanted to offer 100 for this this position and they say, okay, well actually I was really looking for more like 130. Perfect. Now you know that. You know if you can if you can indeed spend more time, okay, maybe the max that we can get to is 115. You don't have to have all those questions right there, but at least you don't get to the end and all of a sudden realize that it's really a mismatch in terms of the budget and then what the, the candidates' expectations are. So that I think is one of the most important questions. And it's a little bit of a debate in terms of how early companies or hiring managers decide to bring this, this question up. I'm a big fan of bringing it up earlier than later. And I actually say even, you know, I know it's not the most important thing to you. However, I'd love to talk about it just so that there's no surprises at the end. My goal isn't to try to get you to say a number. My goal is truly to make sure that, they're, that you're not surprised at the end and neither is the company. So that's the way that I specifically phrase it and, and some of the language and verbiage that's used. Does anybody have any questions about how to talk about competition? One question. Um, how do you avoid things basically devolving into a negotiation at that stage? So for example, in the scenario you just outlined, you have a case where uh, you're thinking you might offer 100, a candidate says you know, they're gonna be in the 130 range, in your mind, you might think, okay, I can maybe spring for like 115 or 120, but the candidate is maybe thinking, I'm not going to go lower than 125, right? Um, how do you avoid, or is it, I mean, do you advise essentially beginning to negotiate at that point? Because you know, there is reason to continue the interview process. If, in my mind, I'm thinking we may converge to around 115. Uh, when this is all over, um, but the candidate may not be thinking that. In the first interview, I would just ask, how much flexibility do you think you have? Okay. I think that we could have some flexibility, um, potentially to add five or 10 pay more. I'm not making any promises at this point. However, uh, you seem like a great candidate, and if you're willing to have some flexibility, I think that we could meet somewhere in the middle. I, would, I wouldn't get into, to, um, too much detail. Mm -hmm. However, yeah, I still think it's worth like even if that's a, a five-minute conversation worth having earlier on because he might he or she might say, nope, like my monthly expenses, I, I'm pretty firm at 130. Perfect. Yeah. Like you just saved 10 hours of, of company time at least by figuring that out earlier on than later. Yeah. For local jobs? Well, yeah, for, if you're recruiting from outside of the community. They, and you're asking them to relocate. And, and, you're, and they're thinking of relocating, even mm -hmm. though just from Chicago. Sure. The cost of living down here is substantially less, and they may not be aware of that. Absolutely. So if it is a local job, local stats are valuable. If you are hiring remotely, then it's national stats. Um, but absolutely, for, for a local rate, if you're planning on asking this person to relocate and they're interested, then yes, it's, it's a local to a local move. And so that's at least how 
I've done it in the recent past as a lot more has become remote, is that if it is a remote company, then you're using national stats. Because this person could be anywhere and you're not biasing if they're in San Francisco or if they're in Champaign. You're just saying, here's our national averages. And this is, and well, and this brings up your compensation philosophy. Because we're located in Champaign-Urbana, and this is our cost of living, this is our compensation philosophy. And it, it really goes a long way in trust building with a candidate because they are trusting you quite a bit. They're trusting you that you're going to, in exchange for solid work, you're going to give them their, their benefits and, and salary. And so building this trust early on in the interview process goes a long way in terms of them continuing to trust you throughout the process until you get to that offer letter stage. But has any, so how many of you have thought about your compensation philosophy? And how many of you don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. So your compensation philosophy is essentially we pay at 50% of market. Our base salaries are here, and this is why. And it is because we offer equity. It is because we think about salaries at a national level, not a local level. Or we think about salaries at a local level, so we compensate at the 75th percentile. But you have to kind of know where you, where you stack in terms of the overall market so that you're able to provide some justification in how you came up with the number that you're about to offer them. That it's not, um, that it's not random or not thoroughly thought through. That it has some, it has somewhat of a theory behind it. And uh, to anyone on this list as well, there's, I do have a packet on coming up with your compensation ranges and your compensation philosophies. There's some really good examples online of people that actually, or companies that actually publish theirs and how they thought through it so that candidates can go to that landing page and see exactly why they were given the offer that they were given. And it, so, it also helps when you're competing with the fangs of the world because when you know what your compensation philosophy is, you can help benchmark it against someone else's. So let's say a company or a candidate is deciding between you and Facebook. Or let's use Amazon because I know there's better. So Amazon has a very, or what they call a backloaded vesting schedule. So if you provide startup level equity in your company at a one year cliff or your vesting schedule where they're getting essentially 25% equity for the four years that they work for the company. That's actually, that's a really good offer in an equity sense compared to Amazon that will give like 10% the first year, 15% the second, and then the fourth year is when you get most of your equity, but the average tenure at Amazon is 2.5 years. So most people never actually realize the bulk of that equity. And so when you start to compare compensation philosophies, you can help educate candidates of why this offer might actually be uh, in their better interest. Well, if you, if, even if you stay with us for two years, you actually receive more equity. So it's, it's helpful to understand all the different, well, essentially your competition as well, and how, your, how yours would, would match up to other offers that candidates might get. Yeah. That's a good, so, you are comparing or give us uh, uh, an example of Amazon and all this. Uh, but what uh, is, are the same uh, philosophical concepts that apply to a small startup companies that the realities are tied in capital, a lot of changes all the time? So there is any, any adaptation to any startup? So you're talking about the changing. The fast pace uh, uh, about the philosophy of uh, when you compare the philosophy of uh, uh, compensation, so uh, because uh, Amazon, FedEx, they have already a structure, fixed uh, budget, uh, they can do progressions uh, from here to five years, but in startups, this situation is a lot more volatile. Sure. So, wh what kind of uh, fit or uh, advice, or, or, is, or is the same? We should do the same as a, 
as a big company where we uh, do our uh, compensation philosophy. I think we should. Com comparison, right. you, know? you should look at them to know what they are, as sometimes candidates are determining if they're going to go to a small startup or a larger company. And so it's nice to know what they are. Should you model them? No. Um, they, ha they have very complex total compensation packages for a reason, but it is nice to at least know that because a lot of candidates too are new graduates and they're not, they, they get their offer and they might actually just sign right away. They don't actually know what are the details of total compensation. And if you're actually willing to just educate them a little bit, like here's how we've thought about it, here are some things to look for, that's the role that I would play is just that we've been thoughtful and here are some things to look for in other offers that you might be looking at for a top a top candidate. Hope does that answer your question? I feel like kind of. Okay, so um, that's a big one. That's probably the biggest question on here that people have maybe the most comfortability or uncomfortability with. And honestly, it's super awkward, that compensation question. Like, I've had to ask it thousands of times at this point, but I went through the interview process recently and someone asked me and I was like, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, what is my number? I don't know. And so it is really, it's good to remember like what it feels like on the candidate side of how uncomfortable that is to try, for them to try to put a price on themselves as well and and at least and that's where that trust comes in like we know that this is challenging to peg a number for yourself here's kind of how we thought about it um because it is it is extremely it is extremely uncomfortable and just from my own personal survey engineers are so honest about it um Engineers constantly will, not constantly, sorry, they will undervalue themselves more than make, make more than other roles. And so I've been in positions a few different times where I know the range is 125 to 145, and engineers like, well, you know, I'm looking for about 85. And I'll tell them, you know, that's really quite below the range. Here's how we came up with our number. Like, we want people to feel fairly compensated at the end of the day not like you said the wrong number in the initial interview and now we're going to run with that that's also a trust building mechanism if you know that your bottom will put that your range is 125 it's also an opportunity for you to determine if you're trying if what how you want to handle some of those situations because that goes a long way you tell a candidate that and another company would never tell them that you tell them you know we did the research and you're actually worth like we think more like 125, and they'll, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I would have, I would have never known. I'm just out of grad school. I, I, I just, I haven't had time to really think about it. Um, and so that goes a long way in terms of building trust, and it goes a long way in your work week. So then you, you hire that person, let's say, and they feel adequately valued versus. Later on, they find out kind of the offers that their friends are getting and that they didn't say the right number a few months ago. Then they're, they're six months into the job and they're like, oh, well, shucks. I could be making 20K more if I just would have said the right number. And so it's also about like, you did the research because you also want your team to feel adequately valued because they're, they're valued members of your team. Your companies won't be where they are without the employees and the talent that you have. And so it is, and that's another reason why I think it's important to bring up early on, as it, it, it starts the trust relationship with, between the candidate and the future employee of hopefully a long relationship with the company. Uh, can you mention a few sources for getting the data that you know, you're uh, in the range that the employer might look at? So a few of my favorites are Hired.com. Hired is a talent matching platform. It's really expensive to use, but they have a, like a how much am I worth calculator on Hired. That's for candidates to go on and determine how much am I worth. But I use it all the time to price roles or to get a second or third opinion when it comes to pricing a role. So Hired.com is great for that. Um, another really good free resource is Robert Half. So Robert Half is one of the largest recruiting staffing firms in, in the world. 
And every year they publish their annual salary report. It's completely free. And it's probably a 75 page publication that has every title that you could really think about. And then it has your percentile, 50th percentile, 75th, and whatever, whatever you're, you'd like to pay this person. Another way, while we're on this, <laughs> on my favorite subject, is when you're thinking about 25th percentile, 50th percentile, 75th, the way that we actually do it at my current company is we have, we have the salary ranges ranked or listed from 25th to 75th, noting that we get equity, so we're never going to compensate the 100th percentile. We're really going to be around the 50th to 75th percentile. And we have reasons why somebody might line up in the 75th percentile. Oh, they have extremely applicable experience when it comes to, to modeling and logistics, or they have extremely ex applicable experience when it comes to video game development. And that's, that's specifically going to help us on our team. That's a, an extra plus that, that wins out over this 50th percentile. So we have that stuff mapped out which is helpful when you're speaking to a candidate as well. You can say, well, normally we would compensate about here, but given that you already have your, given that you already have experience in, uh, in mechanical engineering in this specific field that we're in, we would compensate you slightly higher because you'd be, we assume that you'd be more effective or impactful in the first couple, or then somebody else would have to learn that section or that vertical or industry. <clears throat> so compensation, I can talk about forever because it, I think it is super, super important for trust and then for the future of the employee for, for feeling fairly, uh, fa fairly compensated. Okay, so a few more on here. Um, Let's get actually, since Alan Singleton is in the room, he'll be able to <laughs> fact check me here. Uh, another one that you do need to ask really early on is about visa. So are you, um, will, you will you need sponsorship now or in the future? I think is the legal way to best ask that question. You cannot ask somebody if, they're, if they are a US citizen unless you have a government contract that says that you can only have U.S. citizens working on this government contract. So the way that you can ask that question is, um, are you, or will you now or in the future need sponsorship? And the way that candidates answer this question is also fairly tricky because there are a lot of different visas. So a lot of students will say, no, nope, I don't need sponsorship. And it's because they have their student visa. So they will tell you, no, nope, I don't need sponsorship, I'm fine. And, but what that really means is they have, or sometimes what that might mean is that they are on a student visa sponsored by maybe U of I, in this case, called the F1B. Is that right, the F1B? H1. H1. No, the student one. F1. F1, thank you. Not, not, I didn't combine the two. So the F1 student visa, they could be on, which imply, which requires no employer sponsorship, but it will once that runs out in one to three years, depending on their STEM status, essentially. And Alan has a good presentation all on visas as well. And so those, those are probably the two most important things to ask here. And if you are asking about relocation, sometimes I'll ask, well, actually, I'll leave that for later. Um, okay, so this was actually a content for, how am I on time? I actually don't have a, a watch on me. 12.38. Oh, thank you. Okay, so there's two ways that I determine like, if a candidate is quality in this first grade. One is, have they, do they have some type of an achievement pattern or a pattern of progression? So have they been at the same company, but they've held multiple titles, um, and, and they've clearly risen up the ranks. Um, from an engineering perspective, this doesn't always work, because some engineers really love like honing in on their craft and doing, doing something similar but better and better, where their title might never change. It might be principal engineer for five years. And so this isn't across the board, but this is one way of saying, like, okay, this person has progressed 
over time. And then my favorite thing, which I've, which I've started to try to figure out more and more, is, is, this, is this job part of someone's like overall passion, personal passions and purpose, or is it, is it something that fits their skill set? Is there some type of a mission or a purpose aspect associated with who they are overall? And so that's a, a question that I try to get to, and sometimes I'll just ask the candidate. I'll say, you know, this is our mission. Um, did you apply for this job because, um, because of the skill set? Do you, do you resonate with the mission? If so, why? And so I try to get at that question a little earlier on if, this, if there was more than just kind of the job description that this person saw, that if they saw some type of aspect of the company or the role that fit into a greater part of who they are as a person. Any, any questions based off of that so far? Okay, so the offer. The first five are really all that you need to, like would be the minimums that should be included in an offer. Minus the bonus, that's, a, that's an optional one. Number four is optional. But the minimums that should be included in the offer letter are, of course, the title, a brief description on what the person will be doing, what their base salary will be, and their start date. The rest of these are optional, um, but they're all different parts of the offer that, that are variables that you can think about what makes sense for your company. I do have a, a longer list as well when it comes to monetary and non-monetary benefits. That you can that can be included in the offer package, but this is in the, the actual written offer. And there's there's wonderful templates online that you can get, and I'm sure Research Park might have some as well, or I can provide them um, in terms of templates for the offer letter. Any questions about the actual well, the actual offer letter or the offer letter conversation? So if you're moving somebody to Champagne and you're getting close to this offer mark, or let's let's say they're not even moving. Let's just say that they're it's a remote or they're in the same town that the position is in. It's a good time to say, you know, have you talked to your family about this? Like, what does your family think? And maybe they haven't mentioned their family so far to this point, or maybe you have no idea. Um, but you can kind of say, have you have you talked to the people that are important to you about this? Like, does this does this overall make sense? And then they'll they'll usually offer some type of information if they haven't already. Oh yeah, like um, my kids are super excited as they get to be with their cousins over at the school, or then you'll get more information if you haven't gotten it so far. But the reality is that if the candidate is part of a, a family environment, that they're not the sole decision maker on this offer, and that there's greater conversations. So it's a good time to check in and say, you know, what what does the family think, and um, and how's, how's your comfort level overall with your experience and, and what information you've had so far. So it's important to understand, I've had a few different offers that fell through only because I, I kind of failed to ask some of these final questions about the, about the person's greater life and, and if it did make sense, um, as, as they're not the only decision maker typically. Any questions based off of the offer? I know that there's a lot of information on here. Yeah. Equity offers are often much less transparent than what you're suggesting. So I don't put this in writing, but thank you for bringing that up. Equity is um, typically put in writing only at the offer stage, and t companies will either do a percent or the total number of shares that they are receiving. Maybe both in some circumstances. Um, equity, I, I would leave for, for more of the final conversations versus upfront, like we're talking with base salary. With base salary, I say like, this is the total compensation package. With that in mind, knowing that you are receiving equity and knowing that this does come with a bonus, then what would your base salary be? And this is this is actually a good point because without telling somebody what the total compensation package is, you can't expect them to be able to tell you what base salary that they're looking for. So 
they don't know that the total compensation package includes a 10% bonus and a wonderful amount of equity in a company that they believe in. It's, it's a lot harder for them to nail down a range to, to provide for you. And if, you, if they don't know what kind of benefits are also included, how much they'd have to pay out of pocket, the more information that you can provide for them still, because, I mean, it's not a secret. Like, once they sign, they find out anyways, or before they sign, they get all this information. And so it's really important to be able to give them the total compensation package so that you can get a realistic answer from them back. And, well, it's important to get that realistic answer up front because if you're, if you're not giving them the scope, then you can still have those surprises at the end. And they're like, oh, well, I had no idea that health insurance wasn't actually included in this. So my base, comp my base is actually 25% higher because now I have to pay, I, I'll have to find other means for insurance for my family. And so that's why bringing that all up front is, is my, my personal advice. Um, but, but back to equity. A lot of companies are super secretive, essentially, when it comes to equity, and it's, that's more, I think, your prerogative in terms of how you decide to, how you decide, how and when to decide to share it. Um, it can look sketchy if you only give them a number, because they're just kind of like, great, what is this, what is this 1,000 out of? 1,000 of 10,000? 1,000 of a million? Like, great, a thousand one. Um, and so, and some, some more junior candidates will kind of fall for that, but more experienced candidates would get like more offended by, by providing something that's, that you're not, you're not actually explicitly describing the value. Sort of the risk management hat, uh, the bigger perspective, uh, from the company's perspective, if you decide that you want to give a, uh, a percentage, you have to have an asterisk because if I give Daryl so many percent, then all of a sudden I find, you know, Cynthia is the world's greatest mind and she just wants to join the company, but she has to have a percent. All of a sudden, Daryl's percentage has just changed. Sure. And she may come on after I've made that offer letter and, you know, so you just have to add right. some sort of disclaimer about, okay, this is going to change. So maybe, and that's why other companies decide to not, essentially not put it in writing, but it's a verbal conversation, coaching that candidate around what this piece of equity means, how it would change as the company pool dilutes, or if it doesn't, what, what they're thinking in terms of raising more capital and how that actually does affect your piece of the pie. So it is important that you have somebody at the company that can walk the candidate through that part of the overall compensation package. Most, if it's, if it's someone's first startup, they don't know this stuff. They really don't. Um, maybe they, I usually send candidates information from Carta. Carta has a really good like startup 101, what does my equity mean? What are the questions I need to ask? And Carta actually has like a mini course that takes candidates like a half hour to get through. So I'll send them that link and say, educate yourself on what it means to get equity in a company and then come prepared to ask HR or the hiring manager or myself what, what like you don't understand about how this part of your compensation might work. And new grads, unless, <laughs> unless they've walked, or I, some new grads might not know at all about even what a vesting schedule, what that means, what are the options, what is a cliff, so there's, there's a decent amount of education sometimes that goes on to the, the offer package as well. But one that you're happy to provide because you're getting a, a good candidate out of this overall process and you hope that that person stays. And there's, um, there's resentment that can grow if it seems like there was any level of deception involved in the talent process or, or the interview process, especially the offer process. And that's where you get, um, well, then somebody just won't stay that long if it seems like there is trust for them. Okay. I think that's all I have. Oh, um, so how many candidates do you need for one open role? So a lot of times you open up a role and you're like, I already know the person. I can't wait for this person to join. Um, I, I went to school with her. She's wonderful. And she's going to, she's going to talk to 
the co-founders and we can't wait to hire her. <clears throat> That's wonderful, but like I mentioned earlier, stuff happens with families all the time where priorities can change on a day-to-day -day basis and your top candidate that you thought was a shoe-in might have to drop out for for no no reason or no malintent on the company side or or the candidate side. It's simply that life happens and can take you in different directions. So my comfort zone when I'm recruiting through companies is to have three solid candidates. Then I feel like I can relax and can breathe at night because even if the top two drop out, I still have at least one more person and I won't have to start the process all the way over. Has anybody heard of the uh, secretary hiring dilemma? If any of you like math, then you should click the link. I can't understand it, <laughs> but I can understand the gist of it, which is, uh, okay, so you're hiring for a secretary. And you can see as many people as you want. You can't go backwards, and, and you can't go forwards. So I can see the first person, and I can pass, or I can hire. I cannot bring that person back in, or I can move to the second person. I can pass, or I can hire, and so on and so forth. And so the, the problem here is like how many people do you need to see in order to determine which one is the right one to hire. And it's actually just like a good thought process to have as a company to think about, because some people they say like, well I can't only interview one person, like that, even if that person is by far the best person, you got lucky interviewing them the, the first time, some companies will say, well like, no, I, I have to at least interview another candidate, I can't just move ahead, and you might lose out on the first one. So I'm not telling you I have an answer here, but learning about the secretary hiring dilemma helps you think about how you're going, how you and your hiring team will think about how many candidates that you want to see and how you how you go about passing on uh, on different candidates. Because typically, sometimes you can come back, but a lot of times they'll end up taking positions at, a, at other jobs if, you, if they are a top candidate. Okay, any questions based off of how many candidates I should have per role? And this is this is anecdotal. Like this is not a science. This is my personal this is my personal experience. A path that I like three helps me helps me sleep at night just because I've seen a lot of different variables of why people can drop out at the last minute that you that you really thought were a done deal. Any questions based off of that? Okay, who would like follow-up information from today? Just so I know kind of what to what to send out. What am I gonna be okay, is it talking afterwards? <laughs> and I'll I'll get your emails and make sure that you get the right follow-up information from today. Any last questions? I have a quick one. Yeah. I, I think given your background having spent some time in this area, Ken was talking about the, the differences in, in cost of living. Is there a a psychological barrier to overcome when you are bringing someone from a place with the higher cost of living. If it means that you know, potentially the base salary could actually be lower. So in other words, somewhere in Chicago, they're making 125, but in Champaign at 110, you know, actual value is, is substantially greater. But I can see someone thinking, not gonna take a pay cut, right, to essentially go go take this job in Champagne. Is that something you've encountered? Well, I used to recruit in Champagne for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, yeah. all the time. What we did at Wolfram when I was there is we would literally send the cost of living calculator, and it it's, it's actually a really cool tool, and it would do all the calculations in terms of mortgage, rent, your cost of everything, I mean eggs, gas, all of that is considered into your cost of living calculator. I, ne I did not find that it was too much of a hurdle. I thought that people understood the, the comparison even if they just kind of looked at what they have on Zillow now versus what they could have on Zillow moving. I mean, I do that all the time. Yes?
I would. Is there, I don't know how that would be a loss unless that it was particularly confidential. I see it as a gain in terms of that you're, you're providing them as much information as possible so that they can provide, in turn, do the same. And it would not be a, a sign of, say, um, yeah, for sure. Oh, okay. So you've come up with a base salary. You've come up with a title. You have the. You're, are you saying like actually sending or showing three offers? No, not quite there. Not quite there. Okay. So like, basically, like, I, I assume we the base salary is the first like yes, all all the candidates we know, right? And then after that, what part like, do we disclose? All of the aspects, like for sure one through five, I would make sure that each candidate has a clear understanding of what that would look like once it's in a written offer letter. And then in terms of the rest of your benefits, if you have a benefits package already, like a, just a one or two page PDF that summarizes it, I would send that to all of the three candidates so that they know what their expenses would be on that side. And then, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put in the details of equity into writing. I would have that conversation over the phone, like this is what you can roughly expect. But I, I'm trying to think of a good, or, or a downside, maybe give me a, an hour and I'll have to email you what a downside could be of, of sharing your information. Does anybody else know a downside of sharing offer letter or sharing offer letter information with a candidate before? Oh, you were saying that they might perceive it as that yeah. they are getting an offer. I would just, you could even say, you know, you're one of our top candidates. We wanted you to have, we wanted you to have detailed information in terms of what you can expect if you are selected to receive an offer. So we, I've been part of a few conversations where people think that because entry level uh, candidates don't have a good appreciation for, for equity or a good understanding of, of, of compensation through equity, that, that perhaps you should just skip that altogether and not offer it. Well, where, where do you come down on that? I think you just need to educate them when it comes to equity because it can be wonderful. It can be a, a decent game changer for someone's financial trajectory. And if they understood what they were getting, then they were more likely to value it and more likely to accept the offer and then feel more valued. And I mean, equity at the end of the day is being a part owner in the company, and that is wonderful. You are, is literally, if the company does well, I do well. And there's not, there's not something I don't think better than that. I think that that's actually, that's better than, um, than a base salary in, in some ways. A base salary is consistent, but being a part owner at the company that you work in, where you're not just putting in hours that that then return a paycheck. You're, you're putting in your effort towards this mission that could have this long-term um, this long-term profit in, in the future. And that, I mean, that is what all startups roughly are looking for. You could have the idea that you're going to stay independent for your life or for the company's lifetime. But in a lot of cases, you're looking for that seven to 10 year mark where that equity <coughs> will pay off. and Understanding that value is huge. Um, I, I actually have a decent amount when it comes to that because I've spent a lot of time educating people on how they should, how they could think about equity and where you can misstep in discussing equity with candidates is saying like, oh my gosh, this is so valuable. Like you have no idea how lucky you are. You're getting equity in our amazing company, and and you have no idea how, like how exciting and how much this is going to be worth one day. You know, great, how much is it going to be worth one day? <laughs> well, we don't know, but it's, it's going to be awesome. Um, and I think the more, like, the better way to approach talking about the value of equity is, you know, we're working super hard. We're excited that you're a part owner of the company now, and we really, the, the, the equity is worth this right now at our current strike price. However, in the future, we really expect it to increase NX or we, we expect it to be a decent payoff for our employees. Um, 
and there's there's a really good conversation around this of what percentage of startups end up liquidating or having a um, liquidation event that is like, oh, all of our employees have enough for a down payment now for their next house, like roughly that amount of money. Uh, there's that's like the there's a certain number of candidates. I don't have their percentage off the top of my head. And then there's the next level where it's like, oh, like I could not work for two years. This is wonderful. And then there's the next level where you hear about like the Googles and the and the really mega successful startups where, oh, I never have to work again ever. But it's good to at least sell reality. And I, again, cust candidates appreciate the, the truthfulness and the trust that you're building with them early on when discussing equity from that perspective that you're not selling them something that's not realistic. You're, the, these are the roughly the startup odds, and this is where we think that we'll be within those startups odds. Maybe if we get super lucky, you could end up here, but this is this is what equity means in terms of how we're, we're looking at the trajectory of the company. Um, so honesty is the <laughs> Honesty goes a long way um, in terms of in terms of building trust with your team early on, especially with the, the these few but very crucial details of the compensation package overall. When I first when I joined my first startup, which was a research park company, I had no idea what the equity meant. Um, I, I I came from Wolfram. I joined a startup that was a research park startup called Great They gave me equity. I had no idea if I should ask for more, if I should ask for less. So I got that equity, and then well, since I was a recruiter, then I had to learn how to actually sell that equity, so I didn't really know about it. Um, but it, it's, it really is an, an important tool that you have to be able to educate candidates on what that might mean for their future as, um, as a way to, to gain more financial stability. Okay. Anything else? And this, these are these are really kind of contentious topics too. So I recently entered the the VC world. I I work for a VC. Um, it's an incubator in VC and one also called a venture studio nowadays. So we have this conversation all the time of how the companies are going to disclose equity and at what stage. How, and all the companies want to do it a little bit differently based off of the hiring managers. So. This is this is like a ripe topic. It's not no one that has a perfect. I don't have a perfect, but it's but all of it is just at least worth your company itself coming to the same page on how you want to do it for your your own startups and, and so that you can be on the same page when you are talking to your candidates and that they're not getting different stories along the way. Okay. Thank you.